The Art of Discernment, Season 3, Episode 5, A Biblical Understanding of the Holy Spirit. Well, welcome to The Art of Discernment. I'm Dr. Abner Chow, John F. MacArthur Endowed Fellow and President here at the Master's University. I am so delighted to be with Kosti Hinn today. Kosti is a pastor, pastor of Shepherd's House Bible Church in Chandler, Arizona. I'm, I'm so Glad that he is part of our TMS family as well, getting a doctorate there. I've had you in class. You're such an encouragement to me. Thank you for blessing me in that way. And thank you for blessing the church. You have authored quite a few books, one of which that we're going to talk about today is Knowing the Spirit. And I have read through the book. I've been blessed. I know that this will be a resource to so many people because it doesn't just speak of what the Spirit does not do. It speaks of what the Spirit does and how we should rejoice in what God has done through the Spirit in our lives and our hearts. So I am really looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you for being with us. Oh, I'm grateful, very grateful to be here. And I mean, we were even talking before we had to get told the prompt, it's time to record because we're having so much fun talking about all this stuff. But Amen. I love being out here and love your passion for the Word and your love for people. Thankful for your leadership here, Dr. Chow. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, with that, we should jump into the conversation and really capture a lot of what we were talking about <laughs> yeah. before we officially started recording. And one of the things that I think would help our listeners so much and edify so much would be to hear a little bit of your background mm-hmm. and why write this book on knowing the Spirit. Yeah. So if God would allow me to write, I'd I'd love to, and he has. And that's kind of the way I approach the, even the idea of writing. Much of my writing started privately when I would have to sift through the rubble of bad theology. I mean, I grew up in the prosperity gospel and the word of faith movement. It was it was like a, a giant cornucopia of, of bad theology. And so everything that was there, like prosperity gospel, the idea that, you know, you're going to be happy, healthy, and wealthy if you follow Jesus. And the Word of Faith movement with its uh, metaphysical sort of new age, like what I confess, I will possess. And so I am blessed and I am rich and I am favored and I'm going to have a new house and all that mixed with, I think, some really abhorrent pneumatology where the Holy Spirit is the force or the whatever, some people would make him out to be something entirely different, who will make all those things happen and he's sort of a, a mystical power. To be honest, some of it was just tradition mm. of talking about him a certain way. And so in growing up with that theological framework, I was very confused. Mm. Uh, I knew a lot of the Bible. Some people say, like, you seem to know a lot of scripture, um, you know, for somebody who grew up that way. I mean, I've been in ministry and saved properly for 10 years. It's been a decade plus, going to go on 11. And so, I mean, what do you what do you expect? I'm going to sit around with the Word of God and, and hang around friends like you and others who will sharpen me and learn. I want to get education, go to seminary. So all those things are normal, and it's what we do. But even prior, I grew up memorizing all the same verses and uh, reading the same Bible, and that's what concerns me so much, mm. is I grew up in the church. I grew up hearing the Bible preached. If I showed you my uncle or my dad's Bible, and I flipped it open and showed you their margins, it would be loaded, underlined, pink, yellow, orange highlighters. I mean, the the Bible was not like stuck on a shelf, and it's like, well, now let's just get rich. They would use the Bible, study the Bible. My dad, my uncle, many of the people in my family have gorgeous offices with, you know, mahogany wood and books on the shelves. They're not like, you know, out there raising money and then they go just to the nice hotel or their mansion and go, well, you know, whatever. These men open the Bible. So after being saved and having an understanding, I think of what I would call sound doctrine, orthodox doctrine, what my my heart is very burdened for is theology, pneumatology, the gospel, doctrine like that, in which people can hear a lot of things and eventually it becomes like white noise. So I wrote the book, God, Greed, and the Prosperity Gospel, which was my testimony. That was so that I didn't have to talk about my testimony that much. I just put it in a book and then, you know, teach against the false gospel, the so-called prosperity gospel, and help some people. And also there was a final chapter called Reaching Those Caught in Deception. I think the number one question I get asked besides certain things is, man, I got family in this too, or I got friends in this too. Mm -hmm. How do I reach them? And then I wrote a book called More Than a Healer, 
And I just wanted to write a book about Jesus. I didn't yes. want to sit there and meditate on false doctrine. So I wrote that. It happened to come out like after the COVID insanity. And the book was that Jesus is a healer, but he's so much more. And there's these other attributes of Christ that we should emphasize. And then this just seemed like the perfect segue from that. I have long been disturbed by not only bad pneumatology, but maybe uh, a neglectful approach to pneumatology. So I thought, well, why don't I write something that is just my heart and my study poured out, and then you know what's different about it maybe or what would, what would separate it from other great work that's out there. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. But I thought, what if I was really practical and pastoral and thought about my church as a pastor and, and, and tried to even be wind in the sails of my brother pastors? Mm. So when their people read this book, they're going, oh, perfect. So you're going to say, here's the truth, here's theology, but then here's application. Here's how we live that truth. So the book was just my effort to sift through the rubble, not just hammer, like it's not a, a charismatic drive-by right, right. at all. Um, it just is a book I hope that would be timeless and helpful and have a tone that's pastoral and accessible for everyday people. Well, it really does. It does. And let me encourage you and all of our listeners along that very line that as I was reading it, I'm thinking this is good for my own soul. This is good for my own heart and mind. And I thought this is great for my kids. Mm. This is great for my wife. This is great for people in our church. Because as we were discussing the way we solidify people away from false teaching is to help them to see and to love the truth. If all we say and the way we teach pneumatology, and like you said so eloquently just now, sometimes it's a hammer against false teaching. Amen. Sometimes that needs to happen. Yep. But sometimes it's neglectful because all we do is hammer, mm -hmm. which, like I said, needs to be done at times. There is a call for us to defend against error, Absolutely. Titus and Jude and Second Peter, et cetera. Yep. But if we don't teach people what it is, what uh, that is the doctrine is and what the Bible actually says, then they have nothing to cling to. All they know is what is not. And I can tell you <laughs> lots of things the Spirit does not do and is not. There's... Tons of things under the sun. We could fill a whole season of episodes with that, but yeah. that's not always helpful. No. We want to know why we should worship God mm. because of that third person of the triune Godhead. Amen. So along that line, talk to us, and, and I love the approach of the book, talk to us a little bit about how people can be looking for the Spirit's work in all the wrong places and yep. fascinated by all the wrong things yep. and where we should be focusing our attention instead. Yeah, totally. And I'll, let me play really fair here and like deal with some of the maybe the more emotional driven responses and then also maybe for us being overly impressed with our theology and our, right. ourselves. Right. And so on one hand, I think the challenge is to not be led by our emotions mm. and our feelings. Like, for example, and we hear this often, and this isn't like a, a, a caricature. This is something accurate. People will judge a Sunday, quote, experience at church, whether they felt it or not. Meaning, oh, I just, I love when we sang that song. Like, I, I was really feeling it. That's, mm -hmm. you know, I just really felt God today. And it was the music. And look, I, this morning when we were, we were in chapel and we, we sang, I Surrender All, that was a very moving song for me personally. I was looking at the lyrics, I was singing, and it was a clean sound. It wasn't like there was nothing distracting going on. There was no laser lights and fog machine, and uh, people weren't like getting overly emotive and saying like, come on, let's just sing it again and again and again. It was simple. We were singing, and I was thinking about the goodness of God in my own life. I'm about to preach to a bunch of students about laying sin aside, sins that we lay aside and think, if it wasn't for you, Lord, and then the, the idea of surrender and a yieldedness to the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. I'm just thinking, even that, that line is in that song. And I'm thinking about all that, and I'm very moved. But had you stood up and preached the Word, and I go home and drive home with you know, my wife in the minivan and all the kids, I'm not going, man, I was really feeling it today with that song. Like, that wasn't the only moment that the Holy Spirit was working. I'm thinking, I sang sound doctrine. I meditated on who God is. I reflected on the, the triune God in every aspect of what God does, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and His work. And then as, as well, the Word was preached to my heart. 
Now, let's say the music was maybe uh, not as much of a, a moving experience, and it wasn't like, oh, I was really feeling that song. What if we sang other hymns, and they were just as true? Great. Or what if the sermon was just a, a direct to the heart message, and the word was preached and explained and expounded, and then there was application, and I went home? I mean, just because you weren't feeling it, doesn't mean that God wasn't working. I think we're a very feelings-driven generation. We're wired that way because of consumerism, uh, the marketing aspect of life. Uh, but we would do this like if you were doing a testimonial video about some missions work, you would tell a moving story. You right. would want people right. to feel moved. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with feelings. Actually, they can be very helpful. Uh, we see Jesus moved with compassion right. in many different moments. So right. we need to be so careful, and here's where I'll kind of make this point. Let's not be governed by our feelings and emotion. And now we're dictating what God has or hasn't done based on how we felt. Let's be so careful there. At the same time, can we not, uh, you know, loathe any emotion? And now we're, you know, I base it on my stoicism. And if it was an intellectual exercise and the mechanics of preaching were executed and the songs were this way and that way, I think in both cases, we can at times in the church look at the person having maybe a more, uh, emotional response to the truth and think like, well, we just don't want to be governed by em our emotions, Dr. Chow. Things are getting a little charismatic over here. <laughs> Hold on now. And then over here we think, well, in my stoicism with my you know, hands bolted down, better not even do one of these or you're getting a little Pentecostal on of all of us. You know, and I'm just going to sing these lyrics. They are true. Therefore, God is. Therefore, I am. Thus saith the Lord. And so I go obey. And it's almost this mechanical exercise. And we're very impressed with ourselves that we don't really have any emotions, and it's the mind. And look, yeah, it is the mind, but also there's a, there's a moving element to the way that the Christian life is. is. I'm, I'm going to go do something. Why? I could feel conviction. I could feel great love for the Lord. I, I feel very much God's kindness and mercy each day as a great motivator. So let's not make feelings the be-all, end-all, but let's also not toss them aside and dismiss them altogether. I think balance in that way is so important, and it keeps us from falling into either ditch. If that kind of makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And and I, it just goes back to exactly how the Scripture organizes everything. It's if the standard of spiritual growth is how you feel. That's so dangerous. Yes. I, I can I counsel people in our church and young people here, and they think. Well, I read my Bible, but I didn't feel it, so I guess I didn't have a good devotion, mm -hmm. and I must not be really spiritual, and I don't feel this way about the Lord all the time, so I must be just dry, or maybe I'm not even saved, but I want to love Christ, but what's wrong with me that I don't have these kind of feelings? And you have to say, wait, brother, sister, if you love Christ, you love Christ, yes. and the only one who could cause that in your heart is actually the Holy Spirit. <laughs> whom you are wondering what he is doing in your life. He's actually done something amazing mm. because you hated Christ. You wouldn't have even get a second <laughs> thought about Christ. We wouldn't even have this conversation. Now you're concerned about whether you love him or not. Right. Or yeah, and that is the Spirit's work. You you miss the real work yes. for, the, for the supposed mm. work, the perceived work. And, and because, like you so eloquently stated, people make their feelings and experience the litmus test of spiritual growth, as opposed to what actually the Bible defines as spiritual growth, mm -hmm. um, they, as a result, get really discouraged. Yeah. But at the same time, the Bible does define spiritual growth. And loving Yahweh with all your heart and all your strength encapsulates your entire being. And for us as human beings, that includes our emotions. Mm -hmm when Paul, so captured by the love of Christ mm -hmm. and so captured by the mystery of God now revealed in the gospel in Ephesians 3, yeah. he is not static. Not at all. He is on his knees, Ephesians 3. Mm -hmm. He is praising God for the height and the depth and the breadth of the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. He understands, and, and you can hear in his words, his ethos, 
his passion yep. for the truth now revealed. You, you can hear it in his great love for Israel in Romans 9 and 10. You understand this person is not void Mm-mm. of emotion. Nope. He, his emotion, rather, is captured by the truth. Yes. And everything needs to be captured by the truth. Yep. So that becomes the standard, and that also captures our emotions as well. Amen. I think of Ephesians 3. I preached through the book of Ephesians for our church plant mm-hmm. and figured one of the best ways to start would be the book of Ephesians. And, you know, at the end where Paul is his prayer for them. And what is he praying? That they would be filled with all wisdom and knowledge, that they would know the love of God. And I mean, you, you think about the love that controls Paul in his ministry, feelings and that type of emotion or response. I think we're crazy if we try to suppress that or deny it. I mean, you think about missionaries that wake up every day ready to go again, whether they feel it or not. Why? Because there's something internal that trumps how they feel. There's a conviction. And I, yeah, I, you can get me going on Ephesians 3 and we'll just go off, off the rails everywhere, mm-hmm. but it's such a true statement. Yeah, we've been talking about young people a little bit mm-hmm. here, and that's so fitting because we are at the Master's University. Yeah. And one of the most frequent questions I receive when I teach Essentials of Christian Thought, and we're actually talking through those issues of bibliology, <laughs> what is your standard? Is it your emotions? Is that what determines truth? Or is it the Word of God? How do you think through this? You're talking about the close of canon, so you get into issues about yep. the Spirit and about the issues of charismaticism and such. Yep. And people will come up to me. A lot of the students will come up and say, I'm I'm still wrestling with this issue of continuationism, cessationism, mm-hmm. charismaticism. Help me think through it. They're not belligerent, to be clear. They, they sure. want to learn. Why do you think it is that this is such a prevalent issue among our young people? Oh, that's a great question. I think because the charismatic movement at large is very passionate, mm. very, very loud. And I don't mean that as an insulting right. statement or a pejorative. There is this driving passion. I mean, some of the the sweeping movements of evangelism globally mm-hmm. are that way. Uh, I was talking to a friend recently, over, actually here in kind of the the MacArthur family of ministries. And they were asking me some of the strategic things that we used to do when I was in the kind of more extreme charismatic movement in the prosperity gospel in the third world and in South America. And I said, oh, you, you, you guys aren't doing this. It's, it's like blitzkrieg. You, you bomb the target first, soften it, then you go in with your ground troops. They said, what do you mean? I said, we used to distribute all of our content for free early on, unload free books, free pamphlets, evangelistic teams, connect with the churches there locally and soften the whole region, loving on them with free stuff, and then go in and hold the crusade. Why do I bring that up? Well, where was that coming from? It was coming from a passion to reach, not saying it was the true gospel, but to reach that region. Mm -hmm. And look, I think a lot of our young people see that and go, why aren't we, shouldn't we be doing more? Why aren't we doing that? Or they seem to really be confident. I was talking to a friend actually just yesterday out here and he said, man, one of the challenges I'm experiencing in talking with young people is, you know how conviction and passion is contagious? I said, oh, yeah. When someone's convictionally driven and they're so passionate, but they're wrong mm. or they're off a right. bit, it's really hard to convince someone because you're like, well, no, they really know where they're going. I mean, that's why I would always say, um, you know, leadership being influence is, is fine, but we should be careful to still assess everything through the lens of Scripture. I think we're a very passion-driven generation, and then we can swing the other way and say, well, all passion and all emotion is bad. It's not. It just needs to be ignited by the truth. It's truth first, and then I respond to that. But I think we live in a time where a lot of these movements are filled with passion. Uh, They're using creative means as well. I'm so thankful that like TMU is doing this. Um, I know the MacArthur Center is doing a lot of things with podcasts and a lot of things that, well, why do you think they're grabbing onto a generation now? a lot of our generation and younger, well, a lot of people in those other movements, they, they, for whatever reason, were jumping on board with the use of media to reach into people's palms, if you will, or their homes. And another, I was talking to a friend the other day, he said the prisons are overrun. He's a guy who, the, who, who distributes MacArthur Study Bibles mm-hmm. in the prison system, great friend in Arizona. And he said, you know, they're overrun though with free material from Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, a lot of these other preachers who teach pretty abhorrent theology. And so they're inundating 
these every region they can. And so our young people are in some ways a product of those challenges. I think of movements like Bethel and others that have entered the creative space. They're using right. music. They're using the arts. I mean, at one point, I think Bethel still has this. I haven't, I haven't researched it since I wrote a book on it and did some articles, but they have like a school for the arts as well. And here's where I think we, I'm not broad brushing everyone in the Pentecostal movement, but I think we need to understand that there is a strategic nature to what is being done mm -hmm. to go after the next generation. And so our young people are navigating that. But I think back to even when I was first saved, we, the conversations were, hey, so are you, where do you land on, on continuationism versus cessationism? Are you like John Piper or are you like John MacArthur? I mean, I was just saved mm. and running into guys at different ministry events. And that was their number one topic. People are fascinated by this stuff. And here's what I think the reason is. They want to get it right. Yeah. If you get it wrong, not saying that believe like John Piper has a salvation issue for being an open but cautious continuationist. I'm not saying that. But when you land, you better land having used the Bible and trying to reason from Scripture. And I think a lot of our young people, they just want to know. Because, man, those, those people seem really passionate. Yes. yes. So that would be the – but, I mean, you're older and wiser. You no, know. no, 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 no. No, I, I think in, I agree. I think that's so helpful for our people to understand, and why they're bringing it up is it is the influence, and it's not only the influence; it's an influence in a way that appeals to already what they have learned to appreciate in the culture and from mm -hmm. the culture. If you're already passion driven, like you've said, and then you have a guy who's super passionate, <laughs> yeah. you're going to gravitate toward that person because even if they're wrong. Man, they don't seem like they're wrong. Yeah. So, and if your litmus test is already wired to say, "Hey, this guy, whoever, <laughs> whoever's the most passionate, the the one who wins, wins, yeah," then you're going to follow that person and think that they're right because you have the wrong standard mm. of right and wrong. And then this whole issue of cessationism, continuism, the pneumatology may have had some neglect. So therefore, it's harder to discern through it. You think, yeah. man, maybe the Bible isn't clear. Maybe, maybe it's really ambiguous because no one's expressed it yeah. so much. You know, it's not a prevalent teaching in the church as much as some other doctrines. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean it's not been done. Of course, it's been done. Yeah. And your book is illustrative of that. But it hasn't been done as much for the church in general, universal. And, and as a result, lack of things provide opportunities for false teaching yes. to take the opportunity of the empty space. And so— this is super helpful. And so, okay, Lord, we're, we're talking about young people. We're talking about why they can have misconceptions, and it makes sense given the culture, given the strategy, given the influence. How do we point them, and we've hit on this a little bit, but how do we point them to the work of the Spirit, say, in sanctification? Mm. How, do we, how do we take them looking at, oh, signs and wonders, that's so cool, that's amazing. I don't know if it's true, but... Is that the only litmus test, and, and is that all I'm looking for to mm. praise God for what the Holy Spirit's actually doing in your life right now? How would you help a young person to to think through that? Yep, I'm immediately thinking of passages like from, from Peter, yes. be holy as I am holy. I'm thinking of a lot of Paul's imperative directives about fleeing from sexual immorality mm. and that God's will literally is your sanctification. Amen we need to turn the mirror on ourselves a little more. Mm. We get very pulled, and I'm trying to be gracious here, using yeah. plural pronoun. We, yeah. as a church, we love to look outward. We're, we're enthralled by these stories. I think that's why a lot of people get sucked into some of those books about people who go to heaven. And mm. Like, wow, you know, we're, we're almost wired to wonder, is there more? Is there more out there? Like, am I missing something? Mm. And so these books or these resources come out, and... If we would just flip the mirror and look at our own hearts and our lives and spend more time considering, Lord, what do you want to purge in me? Holy Spirit, what are you convicting me of? That right now I don't need to worry about uh, the next conference or the next high point or the mountain peak experience. Like The mountain peak experience would just be, would you expose Mm. the the hidden sin or the deception of my heart? Would you expose my Jeremiah 17, 9 issue? that right now I'm playing a game or I'm being, you know, what, what the Bible often calls kind of being two-faced or 
Um, I was talking about this on on Sunday in Crossroads, but the the double hearted, you yes. know, a heart and a heart. Mm-hmm. Would you expose in me my my speaking out the sides of my mouth? Because why? Because I love you, Lord. I want to be right with you. I want to worship you and love you with my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want all of my life to be wrapped up in you and to be living for your glory. So instead of chasing the next thing, would you help me just right now to take the next step of obedience? I think if we did that, well, first of all, you the, the enemy won't be happy. But second, you know, that will begin to be a very sanctifying process. Because mm. now we're going to start looking at our sin, our lack of holiness, uh, maybe even our works-based righteousness mentality way more than we think. We mm-hmm. think like, well, I'm going to put yes. on a good show and yes. we all do our Sunday best and we all know how to kind of play church. Mm-hmm. And I think what these mountaintop experiences represent in a way is a manipulative form of of false assurance. Mm-hmm. We go, we see that. We're like, yeah, God's moving. And oh, it just feels amazing. Meanwhile, we've got this whole bag of just darkness in our life. And, and we can keep that suppressed because we're riding the highs. And I think heart work is is surgical, spiritually speaking. And so the Bible speaks a ton to our sanctification. Paul, I like to say it this way, is always pulling back the layers of the heart. Mm. It's like an onion. Um, maybe too illustrative. <laughs> the more you open that thing up and slice into it, the, yeah. the more you cry, you know, like an onion. It, it's when we become appalled by our sin and see our need for holiness, I think then there's much more of a desperation for the Holy Spirit's work mm. in sanctification. Yes, than any need for some other thing or other experience. And here's what I mean by that. I am desperately in need of his filling today. You know, we would say it this way theologically. There's one one baptism. There are many fillings. The command to be being filled with the Holy Spirit is I need him daily. And I in, even in the book, I footnoted this because I thought Pastor John was so helpful. Uh, MacArthur commentates there about the the filling of the Spirit being a moment-by-moment yieldedness, where step-for-step step, I want to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Mm. I'll tell you right now, if that was all I had to focus on, I'm busy till I'm dead. Yep, that's, amen. That's all I need. Just, Holy Spirit, help me to be yielded to you. Why? Well, his job description is to glorify Christ. So I want to glorify Christ. I need the Holy Spirit's help. I need to be yielded and submissive to him. Well, I don't have a lot of time or need then for another mountain peak moment. And I think a lot of times when we chase these experiences, we're chasing something that keeps us busy and distracted from reality. Mm, mm. And so, so true. Those are my thoughts. No, that that is just so helpful. And I sometimes say we're we're selfish and selfless mm. in all the wrong ways. So we good. focus on ourselves when it's in our best interest and when we want something. And then we focus on everything else when we don't want to focus oh, yeah. on ourselves. So, <laughs> it's so much easier. Yeah. So we're selfless for all the wrong reasons and selfish for all the wrong reasons. But I remember, and I think a lot of young people and any person in the faith, as they battle sin, they can often do it in the flesh. Yep. That is the contrast that Paul lays out in Romans 6 or in Galatians 5, and it's exhausting. You mentioned a works righteousness mentality that can infect people. Like, I'm going to just do it, and I'm going to get better on my own, and that's how it's going to work. And and we forget that God does not merely ordain the ends. He ordains the means to those ends, and people get burned out and frustrated because they can't do it on their own, and that's because— they can't. No. Nope. And I remember even as a nerdy kid in school and college <laughs> <coughs> studying Greek, what really captured me was Romans 6 mm. and this thing called the instrumental dative. It's by the Spirit, by the Spirit. And I just started to realize the reason I'm struggling so much is I'm not relying on God to actually do this in my life through the means he set up. Mm. I've just been trying on my own, and here I'm battling sin and losing, not because I want to lose, but because I have been going about it the whole wrong way. I haven't been filled with the Spirit. I haven't, in the sense of being yielded, like you said, or or as Paul in a different passage, Galatians 5, walk Walk. in the Spirit. Every step you take is, yes, 
totally immersed in the Spirit's power, direction, guidance, work via His Word. When you have that, then it's so encouraging because you first, you actually can fight against the flesh. You can put to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of the Spirit, Romans 6 and Romans 8. And then all the glory has to go to God. Mm. And it's so clear that this is only by the hand of the Lord. This is only by the work of the Spirit in the heart, and He is driving us to do these things. And so, yeah, we need to remind our people, this is where it's at, and you need this. Mm. You need Him. If you don't, you're going to be frustrated, and it all begins with those imperatives that you talked about. This is the standard. If we don't take our sanctification seriously, then we don't understand the value of all that the Spirit is doing in our hearts and lives, and He does it by the Scripture. Amen. Uh, Psalm 19, convict me of secret mm. sins. It, it's it's by meditating on God's Word that He investigates our, or He exposes our heart. Um, May the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, as Psalm 19 concludes out, and that's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Well, by just way of kind of concluding all of this, because you mentioned, hey, I, we have these spirited discussions mm-hmm. with co-laborers, uh, former co-laborers, so-called, and how, especially because young people, they can gravitate toward one or two extremes. One <laughs> is, okay, I'm just getting new to this doctrine thing. I love it, but maybe I need I need even more excitement to get into it. I never thought that as a Christian, you should need to think. And then you have these people who love to think. And they also not only love to think, they love to argue. They want to debate. Yeah, they want to fight it out with everybody. And, and of course, we love the heart that loves doctrine. Sure. But we also need to mold that so that the way we are to discuss these things is also obeying the Lord in conformity to the way yeah. the Lord has articulated it. So give us some insight into how do we approach, talk, think through, to discuss, I- encourage convict, rebuke, but also uh, even disciple those who disagree with us on issues. Yeah, that's really helpful. I say this not by way of expertise and having nailed it. I say this by way of failure. Hmm. I've learned the hard way with family members, with you know friends, former colleagues in ministry. I've gone in like the blowtorch and just, you know, you know you're, you're all wolves, you're all false teachers, but don't worry, you know. Come see my friend, Dr. Chow and John MacArthur, and they're going to help you and fix you, just like I got helped when I came to know the truth. You know, that doesn't always work very well, even if you think it will. I've tried everything under the sun and have failed in many different moments, early on especially, because I was in what I would call cage stage. A lot of people know that phrase. If you don't, it's when you get saved or when you come to an understanding of some aspect of sound doctrine, you should be caged for a little while, lest you say something foolish or immature and hurt people and burn bridges. I would say remembering Paul's phraseology with Timothy, teaching with all patience and instruction, being patient with people. And then two, one of the best resources I think that just came out is from the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching. The MacArthur Center podcast has been awesome. In this season, I think it's episode one, season three, where it talks about theological triage. Mm -hmm. And actually, a a lesser known subject with Pastor John MacArthur is his relationship with Jack Hayford and Church on the Way, which was, you know, 10,000 people strong, charismatic, you know, flagship church. And, you know, he, by the way, he didn't drive by and, you know, throw grenades every day on his way to Grace Community all the way until the end. I mean, he was respectful and irenic with Jack. And I think we need to slow down and remember that we may land differently. People are are using scripture to get there. I think it allows for more healthy discussion because we're both looking at the text. If we're emotive in our responses or reactive aggressively, that's going to kind of cancel out irenic discussion. At the same time, what about those people that are coming along? Yeah. What if we're just more patient, more understanding, Mm -hmm. have a few more coffees, a few more lunches? Isn't it okay? Shouldn't it be okay for some people in our churches and, and sometimes majority if we're in like a new area or we're, we're planting a church and people are, many people just want to learn. And I have learned this a little bit as a church planter. Um, I can come on strong. I obviously love doctrine, but I'm realizing there's a lot of people that want to come and want to learn. And they're going, pastor, look, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, about eschatology, but 
I, I trust you and I've, I hear some things out there, but, and I know our church is premillennial and whatever, but like, I'm just, if, are you okay if I just learn for a while? I just want to learn. I'm new to all this. Yes. And you know, what about this guy? And I'm not, you know, Bethel's a little out there, but you know, I'm, I'm wondering about the gifts and all that. So is it okay if I just kind of go on the journey here? I'm like, yes, please, please, please go on the journey. So we try to tell the people at our church to be, you know, very clear with the truth, but also very compassionate with people. And I'll be clear as day in the pulpit, but can we be compassionate with people? And so I, I would say like firm in the pulpit and then flexible with the pew. As people, like you got to give space for them to work it out. If we don't, God will have his way still with them, but we lose the joy, like Paul, of you've got your Corinth situation, Yeah. but then you have your second Corinthians letter, yeah. which shows this response. And thank God that Paul put Titus on Crete. Mm. And thank God for Timothy doing the work he did at Ephesus. And I'm so glad that the Thessalonians were the way they were, and Paul seems to commend them greatly. I mean, different churches in different seasons, but the steadfastness of leadership and the patience of leadership is so important. So I would encourage Christians, we don't need to nuke everyone. Call a spade a spade. But I've gotten nowhere by just blasting people and all fruit that's been born from anything, including some of the responses by the grace of God only with this book, with the new one on the Holy Spirit, had some charismatics or Pentecostals reach out and say, um, I'm, I'm studying and thinking deeper about soteriology and about sanctification than I ever have and about mm. being driven by experiences. Mm. Thanks for not nuking us, mm. you know, for, in page one. <laughs> like, okay. I, I wrote the book kind of even for my own heart to go, hey, what if for several chapters you could come on the journey and, you know, the first words weren't, you know, I'm, I'm related to a heretic, um, you know, charismatics or the, like, what if it was just a little more balanced and pastoral? So I learned like everyone else, I'm human. And through the years, one of the lessons that sticks out, Paul, all patience, he's compassionate, really the heart of the Lord. Who do we hammer? The Pharisees? They're dangerous false teachers. But there's your Nicodemus who comes at night. Right. I call him Nick at night. Hmm. You know, <laughs> he had questions. And in the end, he kind of seems to circle back. Yes. But the Lord's patient. With the Pharisees, you whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers. I mean, there's, there's strength when it needs to be said. Yes. But there seems to be this cadence from the Lord that is steady and patient with the genuine seeker or learner, the person who says, I, ju I just want to know, and they have questions, maybe we could be more patient with them. Yeah, and I think that's that goes back to exposition. Yes. Because exposition both lays out that entire paradigm of patience with those who are learning, we're discipling them, and exposition is the act of doing that. When, when when you open up a book to expound the riches of the Bible, the spirit, mm. the tone of the scripture, the approach of the scripture, the emphasis of the scripture guides people not to fight per se. Sometimes, like you said, with the Pharisees and with other false teachers, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 3, mm -hmm. there is a strength there. But that comes as the exposition of the Word of God comes along. Yes. But at the same time, there are many other chapters which expound upon these truths that say, and you should know these truths, worship God for these truths. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, it actually guides those people who are in error to say, wow, I'm getting deeper into this. That's great. Well, we're so glad. Yeah. We're so glad to edify other believers, and that should be our heart, and that's what I want in our young people as well. Costi, it has been so good. I wish we had more time <laughs> because this is just so edifying, at least to my own soul, and I know and I trust that it'll be edifying to many. Thank you for being with us grateful on this podcast. Grateful for you, brother. So grateful for you. Keep up the great work. Thanks for joining us for The Art of Discernment, a podcast of the Master's University. You can learn more about the university at masters.edu. Be sure to subscribe to The Art of Discernment wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. If you know someone who would benefit from today's show, we encourage you to share it with them. We'll see you next time.